Lesson five, but part three, the overall lesson title is Why Do We Suffer? Okay? I actually had a subtitle for this, Gloom, Despair, But Not Agony, Entropy on Me. Okay? You know the meaning of the word entropy, I know. You know, so uh, that's good. That's good. I see a lot of heads going, uh, yeah, okay. Now yeah, we're going to talk about it. But before we do, Father, as we turn to the Bible, what we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. What we are not, make us. For your son's sake, amen. Just to review, just to review. Um, in the first seven, I mean, in the first ten verses of chapter seven, Job's just tired of it. He's tired of it all. And days are passing quickly, and yet it seems like he can't catch a break. He can't sleep. He can't rest. This is not working for him. And then in the verses 11 through 21, he has some pretty... He says, my bed will comfort me and my couch will ease my complaint. Or so I thought. But you frighten me with dreams and terrify me with visions. That I prefer strangling. I prefer death rather than life in this body. I mean... Guys, he's in a bad way. He's in a bad way. So then we started looking at how God's grace is sufficient. We started with 2 Corinthians, and we've covered these four areas. Through suffering, we learn reliance. That's what Paul was talking about with the thorn in the flesh. I've learned, even though God didn't take it away, I've learned that his grace is sufficient. Through suffering, we are led to repentance. Um, we use the the story of the prodigal son, how in his suffering, his heart was turned back to the father. His heart was turned back to the father. Through suffering, we grow spiritually. There are things that we don't learn from a spiritual perspective, from our personal walk with the Lord. We don't learn them unless we go through suffering. It's, it's not something that you just kind of pick up glibly along the way. It's something that you pick up uh, as you go through the, the muck and the mire, so to speak. And then through suffering, we grow in righteous. We not only grow in our spiritual selves, but we grow in our daily lives. We grow in the ways we show God's righteousness in our lives. When we go through a hard time and people say, how are you handling this so well? And we say, God. We say, Jesus. We say, it's because of him who saved me. When we say that, we are giving physical proof that God does not just exist, <laughs> but that God is very active and very alive in our lives. So, shall we move on? I think we should. Whether you want to or not, <laughs> we're going to. Through suffering, we learn how to help others when they suffer. Uh, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through, 3 through 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Notice the God of all comfort, the God of all mercies, the God of all comfort. He comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ overflow to us, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort which produces you in you patient endurance of the same sufferings that we suffer. And our hope for you is firm because we know that as you share in the sufferings, show, so you will share in the comfort. I'm going to caution you about using a phrase. I'm going to caution you about it. I've, I've learned, how shall we say, not to use this phrase, um, except in certain circumstances. The phrase is this, I know how you feel. 
somebody's going through something, they're going through some something that's just mm, agonizingly painful. And you say, I know how you feel. If, if they don't say it out loud, it's in their brain. Trust me. You don't know how I feel. You don't know what I'm going through. And the truth is, you don't. Even if you have had the same situation, even if you have gone through exactly the same thing, you don't know exactly how they feel. So, how does this verse apply? Okay, even then, you're, you're exactly right, but leave the word, leave the phrase out, I've been the, through this too, okay? But, but you know what helped you. You know what helped you. And sometimes it's what helped you, not so, what someone said that helped you, but what helped you. Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> I wish you would have. That would have been a great story. <laughs> Even though it's true. Even though it's true. Even though it's true. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to open that door. But it's a matter of just saying, I'm praying for you and I'm here for you. There you go. And if you need anything, I'm here. I would like to say you're spot on. And I'm glad you said don't tell people I know what you're going through. Um, we all have suffering. We've all been through stuff. And I had a maker trial. And I had a, a, a man talk to me. The first thing out of his mouth was like, I do not know what you're going through. Yeah. <laughs> he goes, but this is what I'm on through. This is what the suffering I've, I've been through. And he goes, I'm not even forgetting how you're, you're feeling because I'm sort of trying to figure out how I feel. Right. That. And it is a very arrogant thing. I like telling people, like, when I was going through it, like, I don't even know what I'm doing. Yeah. How yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Right. And, and I think the key thing with what you're saying is it's okay to say this is what I've been through. Yeah. A lot of times we like to. Back on us, like when we're helping, let me right. tell you how that I had it. Yeah. You were as strong as me. Yeah. Right. Not sympathy, but empathy. Empathy to walk through to the same. I've been through something. There you go. I'm not saying it's worse than yours or not as. I mean, I've just suffered too. That's right. And I'm just here. And I think the benefit is that we need to know that when we're suffering, we're very isolated. Alone, and we just need to know that you're not alone. There you go. The only person who's suffering. You're not, you know, it's not pick you out from everybody else. And like, right. Blue and blue, we all suffer. That's know, right. I'm here, whatever you want. You want That's right. Cry, complain, moan, or if you want to go I'm just here. But that, that phrase, that phrase, I have no idea what you're going through. I can't imagine how you must feel. I cannot, I cannot begin to even grasp what you're feeling that that kind of empathy that kind of empathy says i am here because i know you are hurting i am talking to you because i know you're in pain yeah yes ma'am be present and be quiet like Job's friends did. You know, we talked about them. When they first showed up, they sat with him for a week. That would drive us nuts. But there are times when we need to 
when we need to just sit, even when it's uncomfortable, to just be with someone. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We need each other in that, but what are some other things you can do? When when you've you know, y'all have talked about when you've gone through things, right? When you've gone through things, there are things that really helped you. I'll be honest with you. Um, one of the things when when Pam was so sick, you know, uh, she had Legionnaire's disease. I don't know whether all of you know that or not. Almost died three times. Okay, was in the hospital for was it a week and a half, two weeks, something like that, and in a long period of time. And when it was over with, people brought food to the house. And you think, what good? I'll tell you what good it does. That really comforted me. Because I, I didn't feel like cooking anything or preparing anything. You know? I appreciated people saying, just in passing, just want you to know I'm thinking about you. Just want you to know I'm praying for you. Just seeing the food itself that somebody else prepared tells you. Yeah. That somebody cares. Right, right. You know, right. And you can show your love to me anytime you want, um, just so that you'll know. <laughs> I know, right here, look at here. She's showing her love. There you go, girl. Thank you. <laughs> All right, anytime. So, guys, I got to tell you, this, this verse to me, to me, is probably one of the greatest um, reasons to rejoice in the midst of suffering. Because when you're on the on the downside of whatever it is you're going through, you're going to say and and think this way. I'm ready now, God. When someone else is going through this. You open the door. Give me an opportunity to minister. Give me an opportunity to, to be your presence in their lives as they walk through the muck and the mire. I've told you all before, but some of you are new. Thank you for being new. I can tell this story again and know that uh, there's a fresh audience. My good friend, Pastor Georgie. Pastor Georgie came from Liverpool, England. And in Liverpool, they had a saying. They had a saying. And one day he stopped by my office on his way to his office. He stopped by my office, stuck his head in and said, there is Bob, my old stick in the mud. <laughs> I said, George, he said, you are, you are my stick in the mud. I said, George, do you know what that means? He said, of course I know what it means. It means you're the one I lean on as I go through the muck and the mire of life. You're the one I can trust as I go through the stuff. Well, that's kind of nice, isn't it? You can be someone's stick in the mud. Because God has prepared you for that. When you go through the suffering, God has prepared you for that. Joseph, we haven't discussed this, but you've told me before that I have, I have the privilege to do it, so I'm going on. A lot of you may not even know that uh, Joseph is fighting cancer right now. You might not know that. How long have you been? I know you, you went into something like a remission and then came back out of it. Uh, three years. Three years. He shared with me one time, and uh, I... I've had occasion on a, a couple of times just to share this with people, but he shared, if anyone ever wants to just talk to someone 
who's going through it, give them a number. Okay? Because when you have gone through it, when you are going through it, you're learning things that you never even knew existed in your life, in your heart, in your mind, in your spirit, in your emotions. You're going through things, and God does that for a reason. He allows that to happen for this purpose right here, so that you can be the one to step in and be that source of comfort. You can be that stick in the mud. We got to go on, got to go on. Through suffering, we demonstrate the life and hope of Jesus. Uh, go to 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4. Oh, I know it says 2 Corinthians, but go to 1 Peter 4. 12 through 14. Now, if you know anything about 1 Peter, you know that his primary focus on suffering is people who are suffering for the cause of Christ. They're suffering primarily because they are Christians. But they are suffering, okay? They are suffering. And he says this, Dear friends, don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes among you to test you as if something unusual were happening to you. We've talked about it before. Our bodies are mortal. We are going to age. We are going to suffer. We will be afflicted with disease. We will have to deal with stuff. Part of living in a sinful world is dealing with the sin of others. Do you understand what I'm saying? And that can cause great suffering. The thing is, guys, he says, don't be surprised. Now, again, he's talking to Christians saying, don't be surprised. You know, they hated Jesus. Come on, they'll hate you too. But we shouldn't be surprised at all. Instead, rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ so that you may also rejoice with great joy when his glory is revealed. If you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit and glory of God rests on you. How is his glory revealed? I've already alluded to this. Again, I've dealt with cancer. I'm on the other side of it. Megan and Joseph and I talked once about survivor's guilt and how he had a temporary bout with it because he went into something like a remission at one point. When when I came out of it, when I when I came out of the prostate cancer and 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 had no cancer. And my oncologist and my urologist, who was my, also my oncologist, he had been a surgeon at MD Anderson and got me hooked up down there and got and has been done all my follow up. Every time he sees me, every time I go back, he says, I say this every time you come in here, but I have to. We should not be having the conversation we're having right now. He said, with the, with the way that had gotten into the margins, with the way it had gotten into the lymph nodes, with the way it had spread, with the, with the stage that it was at, with everything that you have faced, you should not be sitting here cancer free. And yet, here you are. And he's told me before, he said, I know that you pray. And he said, your prayers have been answered and there's no other way to explain it. And so in my mortal body, I can truly say that I am an evidence of Christ at work in me. But it's hard to say because of that survivor's guilt thing. It's like, how dare I be okay? You know what I'm saying? How dare I be okay? And yet I have to say that because God brought me through that. But I'll tell you one other thing. The real miracle was not that God brought me through that. The real miracle came before the surgery, before I ever went under anesthetic, even for the biopsy. Because I prayed and asked God to give me his 
peace. I realized that this could kill me. I realized that I could die. And I said, hold on, God. I mean, literally, this was my prayer. Hold on, God. Those words. Hold on, God. Am I going to die? I asked that question. And then I remembered. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And what they said, and God brought all this to my mind. I remembered what they said. If our God chooses to deliver us, He will. If He chooses not to, we still ain't going to bow down to you. And I said, I get it. I get it. God, this was the real peace. The real peace that came in that moment. The real peace that showed up at that time was a peace that said, God can deliver me. God will deliver me. But if he doesn't, I still will not bow down to the fear. And from that moment on, through the whole process, I had a peace that just was godly. It was not mine. It was not my peace. It was not my calm. It wasn't me breathing deep. It was all God. I shared that with, with my urologist also, and he said, I believe it. We exhibit in our mortal bodies when we go through suffering and we show what God can do in us and through us. We demonstrate the life and hope in Jesus. One last individual one, then we're going to kind of wrap up. Through suffering, we know Christ intimately. Have you, just out of curiosity, ever been through suffering with someone else? Have you? Would you raise your hands if you have ever been through? So everybody get your hands up because I know you've been through it to some degree or another. There's a bond that develops during those times. There's a bond that develops during those times that is very unique. It's a bond that doesn't happen unless you go through those times. You know, I've known Pam since she was born. My wife, Pam. I've known her since she was born. We grew up two doors apart. Okay. She obviously has not known me since I was born, since I was born a year and a half before. But that's neither here nor there. You would think, you would think that I would know everything there is to know about her. Right? You would think that that would be the case. When she was having a procedure done, when she had the Legionnaire's disease, she was rushed from here. They realized, we can't do this. Put her on an ambulance, took her over to College Station. Middle of the night, Saturday night, okay? Middle of the night, and uh, we get over to the, to the ER in uh, College Station, and uh, just so happens, there's a thoracic surgeon that was extremely well known, I didn't know him, but I mean, very well known, who, these hospitals share doctors back and forth, right? He was from Fort Worth, and he just happened to be down there. And he was the one that showed up. And uh, so we're out in the hall. We're out in the hall. And uh, I was talking with him about it, finding out a little bit about it. Pam, if, if you know anything about Pam, she can suffer with a smile on her face and has <laughs> a lot, okay? She just can do that. Uh, me, if I'm suffering, 
you're going to know it. <laughs> you're going to know it, buddy. <laughs> and if you don't catch it from what I do, I'm going to tell you. Okay. But no, not Pam. And uh, so she's in the room getting ready for this procedure, which she is going to be awake during. They're going to have to drain her lungs from the back, insert a massive needle into her pleural cavity and, and drain fluid out. And by the way, they got two big jugs like this out of her. And uh, so I'm talking to this doctor out in the hallway and I said, you know, I said, here it is, man. Saturday night, midnight. We're coming up on midnight. I am so glad you decided to come in. I said, I'm afraid if it was me, I would have just told him, just have her take two aspirin. I'll see you in the morning. And he looked at me very deadpan and said, Mr. Young, she won't make it till the morning. I thought, wow. <laughs> so then my next job is to go in. They put her on one of those, you know, tables like you have in the hospital. She was on the side of a bed leaning on that table. My job was to go in and hold her hands knowing this. Now again, a lot of you have never heard Pam sing. Your loss. Your loss. The lady is incredible. <laughs> incredible vocalist. They are draining her lungs. The lungs she uses for singing. You know what she starts doing? While I'm holding her hand and trying to encourage her in every way that I can, she starts singing. If ever I lost my Jesus is now. She started singing. She went all the way through that procedure. And yes, there was some pain involved. Yes, it was kind of drastic. Yes, I'm looking over her shoulder, looking at these big jars of green stuff that's come out of her and I'm just going wow. Jesus if ever we needed you it's right now and here you are here you are right in the midst of it through suffering I gain an even closer relationship with my wife and in so doing, an even closer relationship with my Lord. Intimacy does not occur because we, uh, it doesn't just happen. It occurs, intimacy in any relationship occurs as people do things together, but especially as people go through hardships together. There's a, there's a bond that grows there that just cannot be explained. So when we read this passage, indeed I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him, that I may know him, that I may intimately know him, becoming like him, becoming like him in his death that I may know him in his suffering. Wow, people. You want to know Jesus? You've got to suffer. Why do you have to know that? Because Jesus suffered. If you don't know Jesus in suffering, you don't know Jesus. There is a... a um, I'm going to say a pervasive belief in, in uh, 
Christendom today. I would call it Christendom, yeah. In a lot of churches uh, across the, the scope of Christianity that want to deny suffering, that, that want to say suffering has no place in the Christian's life. There's a lot of there's a lot of preachers who will tell you if you're hurting that's on you. God wants to bless you. He doesn't want to hurt you. If you're hurting that's on you. And so a lot of people are led to believe that the the way to to experience Christ, the way to know Christ intimately is to be joyful. And you work it up as best you can, but it ain't getting you nowhere. It's empty. It's vain. Because you have to go through suffering to realize who Jesus is and what he did for us. Now, our suffering can never measure up to his. You know, Paul in Hebrews even says... We haven't, we haven't suffered to the point of the shedding of blood. Our suffering doesn't measure up. Let's not, let's not kid ourselves here. But until we've suffered, until we've known pain, until we have very felt the very presence of Christ in the midst of that suffering, who says to us, and he means it, and he can say it, are you ready for it? I know what you're going through. Jesus says it and he can mean it because he does know what we're going through. The scripture tells us that he was tempted in every way that we are. I got news for you folks. He experienced every pain that we feel. Every pain that we have that we feel, he felt. Everything that we go through, he experienced. And he did it all oh my goodness he did it all being god in flesh he gave up his rights as god he gave up his rights as god becoming like a man taking on human flesh and then he tells us and we need to do the same thing we need to have that same attitude So guys, let's review, shall we? Through suffering, we learn to rely on God. We can't rely on ourselves. Through suffering, we are led to repentance. Now, boys and girls, I encourage you to repent prior to the point where God has to slap you upside the face. But if necessary, it can happen. <laughs> and if necessary, God will allow you to experience the consequences of your own actions. In some cases, he's going to let you walk into something knowing full well what you're getting yourself into. We are led to repentance. We grow spiritually. That intimacy with Christ is growing spiritually. It's an internal strength that comes from spiritual growth. We grow in righteousness in what we do and the way we live our lives. We learn how to help others. Oh my goodness, we learn how to help others. That's good. We demonstrate physically the life and hope we have in Jesus. And we develop an intimacy with Christ. Now, we're going to spend another eight weeks in the book of Job. The question was, why do we suffer? That was Job's question all the way through the seventh chapter. You know how God answers it? I'm going to give you a little, little, little uh, foreshadowing here. Jump into the end of the book, right? I'm going to give you a little foreshadowing. God doesn't answer the question of why. We suffer. In the book of Job, in the book of Job, he does not answer the question of why. 
You know what God says? Same thing the pastor said in the sermon this morning. God says, I am God. Go ahead, look at the end of the book. That's what he says. I mean, you know, God takes a few more verses than that. But the Reader's Digest Condensed Version says of those last verses, I am God and you are not. Trust me. I put these things in the middle of this lesson so that you would have them to hang on to as we go through, this, through the rest of the book, okay? I want you to remember those things when you go through suffering. I want you to keep them in your mind when you're in the middle of it that, yeah, you're going to come out on the other side of it and that God is going to use you. He's going to use you in the middle of it. He's going to use you as you go through it. He's going to use you on the other side of it. But the main thing we have to keep in mind throughout this whole book is he is God and we are not. And we must trust him. Father, we thank you that you are God. And quite frankly, we thank you that we are not. <laughs> we couldn't handle it. We can't handle the, the piddling little stuff that comes along in our daily lives. And, and we get all messed up and all verklempt over things that are just so insignificant in the grand scheme of things. Father, we thank you that you are God when we're not. And we thank you that we can trust you. Father, as we go through suffering, remind us that there are things that you do. You take things that are not so good and do good things with them for the sake of those who are called according to your purpose. Remind us of that when we suffer, when we come out of it, and then use us to be instruments of your peace and your grace. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.